So you all, we have some guests today, live in the house in Pond Lab. Hey, introduce yourselves, if you would, to the class. You're in the class, so you just came by Pond Lab to, uh, to just like see what's happening over here, all this craziness. <laughs> we doing millennium introduction. Yeah, I'm Kai Lewis. I'm a biomedical engineer major, and I'm from uh, Fulton, Maryland. I'm Kendra Key. I'm also a biomedical engineering an engineering student, and I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, and uh, when you talk, you can look right at that camera on top of the TV, man. Go ahead, man. I'm Quentin Anderson Watson. I'm from Washington, D.C., and my intended major is mechanical engineering, or my major is. Cool. Is hey, and you guys, and you guys all hang. You're, you, the reason they're not wearing masks and they're together, friends and family, is because they quarantine together. So we're, they're all good. Like they're, that's where we're at. But I'm not. In, when when I'm in there, they had a mask on. Hey, can you guys just go up to that table, in right in front of you, Quentin? There's a table over there. Oh yeah, you got it right there. Ah, yeah, right uh, dude. The you got the cho you got the candy of your choosing. Can you eat a piece of that? <laughs> oh, yeah. piece? Okay. Right now? All right. Dude, just eat half, man. Just open one and have half. What do you got, Ty? What do you what do you, Kai? What are you rocking with, man? You got M and M's? Yeah, I got M and M's. Dude, M and M's. Mm -hmm. Dude. Okay. You guys are rock rocking the Hershey. Chocolate? Yeah, some chill right. for today. Okay, man, we'll just take half. We'll come back. All right, so class, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna watch a video. And what we'd like you to do, we're gonna not stream the video live, so you can just hop, you know, open another window on your computer, or if you're on your phone, however you wanna do it, and go to social19.org backslash video. And we're gonna watch that video. It's, I think, Jeff, it's about 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Um, yep, something like that. Yep, so uh, we, we can't, we don't want to stream it on the stream because uh, we'll get we'll get knocked off, right? So right now, everybody in class, you can just go to social19.org backslash video, and the video that's on that page, that's the one you're going to watch, okay? It's about Coco. So here's, let me say, say a couple of things. It's a, it's a really startling video, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's crazy. Um, so a, f a f colleague of mine is the person who, uh, a person who is involved in putting that together. And, um, and so uh, is, um, and here's what he says. In fact, you know, he's one of the people that's really involved in bringing this issue to the attention of the public. And one thing that he said was that he can guarantee that unless you buy cocoa um, or you buy your chocolate at, in a fair trade way, right? You buy fair trade chocolate, meaning that it's sourced from farms that pay a fair wage, it's produced at every level of the production process people are paid a fair wage and then ensured that um, no um, um, deleterious things happen along the way. Unless you purchase your chocolate that way, it's almost an absolute guarantee that there is slave-made chocolate, slave-made, slave labor in the chocolate that you're eating. So the chocolate that you have has traces for sure, just the way chocolate is sourced around the world, it's almost a guarantee that it has that chocolate has slave labor in it. And uh, it's all chocolate that you eat, unless it's fair trade. And um, just kind of give it, what are your initial thoughts? The fact that these kids uh, do this much traveling to make a living and then they're deceived into I mean, they're just tricked into the slave trade and they work all these years so hard, suffer so many injuries and gain no net benefit at all is just, it's just horrible and excruciating sight to see. Yeah, I think it's also, it was kind of shocking to see that like, you know, there's, that's like, that's like taking place like nowadays, like that video seemed pretty recent. 
And so, and the fact that it's so widespread that there's labels to sh- like tell you like, you know, if it's come from like a legitimate source or not, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of, you know, at the very least, like very, very concerning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Quint- Quint- Quentin, I want to ask you a specific question. How's it feel watching that? Um, it's shocking to say the least. I mean, like, you know, growing up in America, it's like, it, it's hard to like imagine that slavery is still a thing. It's hard to imagine that people are still like being just trafficked and their labor is just being taken from them with, without compensation. And it definitely hurts, honestly. Like, <laughs> that's all I can say. Hey, so the the statement that the guy the gentleman made at the end you guys have twitch on right on your yeah. computer so jeff can you just put that up really fast i want to show that slide um for the class um this this gentleman here the the statement that he made they are eating my flesh if he had to say something to to you all right you the three of you who are consuming chocolate right he would say that you are eating his flesh. What would you what would, what would you want to say to him? I mean, first I would definitely apologize. Like, like, dang. Like after after I watched that video and understood what I was doing, um, definitely like the next time I see chocolate, I'm definitely gonna think of this video and it's gonna, I don't know. I guess spark some concern, and in regards to what I would like say, I, I, I wouldn't have any words. Like I would just take what he had to say to me, uh, mm-hmm. and accept it. Yeah, I, I mean it's a metaphor, but like in a very real way, in a very real way that that it really is like what's happening, and so uh, it's just it's just hard because it's so abstracted like from our normal everyday reality, and so it's just kind of hard to like you know you know, make that relation. But, you know, I'm sure like there's other examples in our daily lives where, you know, things like this are happening. I'm sure it's not just for Coco, but yeah, I don't even know what I would uh, say. How, how about how about the, the idea that, have you guys heard people say, you know, when we talk about inequality or, you know, like Black Lives Matter issues, right? Let's say, or any anything, you know, children on the border, Im- immigrant children who are in cages and they, they really are. I know that, People on the left make that sort of metaphoric, but it's absolutely true, actually, right? So that, the, and people will say, but I didn't know about it. And people will say, but you should know about it. Why didn't you know about it? Why aren't you aware of these things? And so if someone said that to the three of you, if this gentleman said, why don't you know about this? Like you, all you have to do is get on any search engine and put in chocolate and slavery, and you'll get a long list of articles and videos and, you're not going to see it in TikTok, right? But you know, you're going to see it. Like, and he might say to you, like, "Why don't you know about this? Like, how how can you go 18 years of your life and you never even heard about? It? You never bothered to hear about it, right? What would you say to him? Um, I mean, for me personally, it's like I I would understand his like his anger, his frustration, but it's it's not something that's kind of like. It's easy to find, but it, it doesn't really slip your mind to kind of go out and search for that, you know, because it's like mm-hmm. growing up in a first world country, it, everything is always, we, it's just easily accessible. So you never really slip your mind. It never really comes to you to actually think about where stuff comes from. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, I just feel bad, man, honestly, like this sucks. It's, it's shocking, for real. Yeah, me actually, I actually have heard about it before um like a very like a long time ago but like this definitely seems like something familiar that i've heard of before and i still i've got to admit like you know i've still like eating chocolate and so it's like does that make me a monster or does that make me an advocate for you know modern day slavery uh that's that's definitely an interesting question to have but uh yeah i mean i didn't find out by uh explicitly searching for it because it's, it's like one of those things that you know, that's not something that is uh, even meant to be out there. Like the way that it's mm-hmm. set up, you know, I don't think that we were, I don't think that we're supposed to know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so maybe yeah. that's not our fault. Oh, 100%, yeah. 
Yeah, well, it and, and at the same time, though, it, it, it's like so many things in the world, right, that we can we can learn about them. It, you know, it's like if we, if we decide to, right? So this is one thing that people often say about racism in the United States, like, ple- like the police, right? And the way the police respond to, to differentially to young men like you versus young men who look like me. And so, you know, you might say, like, why don't you guys, why aren't you guys paying attention to the police, like to all this stuff that's happening? And, and I might say, yeah, I probably should pay attention. And then now this guy is saying to you, why aren't you paying attention to this? And I think there's a way in which it just becomes, it's really complicated, you know? Hey, so a couple, Jeff, if you can just throw a couple more things up, I just want to show you, uh, you know, a couple slides. Again, first off, so you so you know there are more slaves in the world today than at any point in human history. So uh, that that's the first thing to, to say. But you know, in Cote d'Ivoire in the Ivory Coast, it's about 150,000 to 200,000 people are enslaved in the cocoa plantations, and about 15,000 are children. So and Cote d'Ivoire is responsible for about 40 percent of the cocoa crop, which is you know very much why I'm we're talking about that. And by the way. Uh, so there's has been a, for many years a big movement for the chocolate industry to pay attention to this issue. And if you go to the next slide, this is a quote from um, from Nestle's. Uh, just uh, what they say, you know, that it's it's uh, it's going to cost customers, right? And so then the question is, how how much are we willing to pay? You know, if we're talking about a a little chocolate candy bar and we have to pay one cent more or two cents more. Why not? Why don't we do this? Like, why? Why isn't it? Why isn't it part of the, of the world? Would you guys pay more? I mean, I'm assuming you would, right? Like, you guys would. Yeah. Yeah. yeah honestly, to prevent that, yeah, for sure. Hey, so it's wait, and, and so unfortunately, man, I didn't write your names down. The one, the one in the is it Nate? Nate? Not Nate in the middle. It's oh Kendrick. Kendrick. <laughs> Sorry, man. There it is. I see it on the screen now. Hey Kendrick, man, what what do you think it is that you the first time you kind of heard that to to not like let it really sink into you? So like, what did I th- what did I think? Yeah, how did it not sink into you then? Because this is a big issue, man. Like slavery, we're talking about slavery, right? Where this isn't like just paying low wages. We're talking about slavery and like all the products that we have that have been made by slaves, these shirts haven't been made by slaves because or sweatshop labor, because, you know, we insure, Jiggy insures that. But like, what is it that you like coming in your life thus far? I mean, I, I mean, it's really like, like, I don't mean to like complain in the sense that like, it's my suffering is greater than his, but uh, like, this is like a very third world problem. But like I said, like, it's really hard to kind of like, make that direct connection between, you know, maybe a small part of your life and then what may be like a big part of someone else's life. And so, yeah. you know, that maybe that's a third world problem and maybe that's insensitive, but it's, yeah, it's just, I mean, that's just how it is. It's, well, well, it certainly can help you to understand why some people don't pay attention to racism in the United States. It's like, why? Well, it's not my, I don't see it, it's not my issue. I'm like, yeah, why, why would I pay? Or sexism, right? Like, why would I, what's the point? Yeah. Um, here, let me ask you, uh, let me, let me, Jeff, can you throw something? Have you guys ever heard of uh, the Great War of Africa? Do you guys know anything about the Great War of Africa? No. Are you guys, any of you? So like, uh, you, you know, most people haven't, right? So here, this is the, the war, this is the Second Congo War, it's also called, which is fascinating that we don't talk about this because in, ten, in a 10 year period between like 1998 and 2008, about 5.4 million people died, right? And th- think about that. 5.4 million people died in a 10-year period, the Great War of Africa, that we don't even, we never talk about. It's just not part of the, the conversation. And by and large, this war was fought over these, these uh, very expensive minerals, right? Cobalt and, you know, cobalt, coltan, tantalum. And, you know, like the, the key is that um, these are really key, right? These, I mean, these are, cobalt is a, is a rare mineral and y- y'all like would be f- familiar with this. Like it has a very high 
a, a melting ratio, right? It takes a lot of heat to melt this. And we use it in resistors and, and, and electronics. And in fact, if you have a phone or that laptop computer, your phone right behind you definitely has these minerals in it. And coltan and tantalum comes from coltan. It's the same thing. We make resistors and capacitors for them. And we can have any of this stuff. Lith Cobalt is lithium ion batteries, as I recall writing. But we couldn't have any of these electronics. And by and large, those kids right there, that, that's a photo of kids and their mothers who are slaves. And they're mining those materials. And so when, you know, like when we hold up a cell phone, the, these cell phones that all of us have, have these minerals in them. And this is slavery. This is happening. Yes. This is in the world, man. This is just part of it. This is part of life. This is pretty and like, nice. damn, man. It's like, and then what makes us be willing to, I don't know, just step up and say like, hey, we really probably should do something about this. And what makes us just keep going? Let me ask you guys, like, what would make you... So this affects everybody, man. Everybody has slave made, you know, if you have a cell phone or you have a laptop, you definitely have, have minerals in that. You have these elements. 5.4 million people died in that great war of Africa that was fought over these minerals, man. Yeah. Hey, so anyway, go back to you guys. Like, what do you, what, what would it take for you guys to say, all right, man, I'm gonna do what I do. I'm gonna study what I study, but I, I gotta dig in on this, man. There's a lot of, man, what would it take? I'm always asking this question, by the way. Can you rephrase the question again? The question is, what would it take for you guys to just dig in on this stuff? You know, like... Well, I think clothing. one way that... Yeah, that is already kind of being... Even in the way that it's being presented to us uh, about, like, making the connection between, you know, what's going over there and, like, you know, something that we all have. So I think that's one way, but uh, ultimately, I don't think that that's going to be the thing that really gets people or, or like, myself to, like... Like, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But I think that something like, you know, making that connection between, you know, what we have and where it, came from, where it comes from yeah. is, is one thing. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. Learning about this more has definitely made me uh, increasingly curious about the topic. And it's gonna make me question what I put my time into and what I'm like using the most. And I don't know, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Cool, man. And this is what it is, right? This is what education is. That's what schooling is. This is what's coming alive. It's what, it, what it's all about with our minds. Anybody, anything else? I mean, I, th I think, uh, I just want to say this real quick. I think it's important to be kind of blunt that in that, you know, after, th after this class ends, right? Like after we've had this conversation and you know, the, the 400 or 500 or so people on the stream, uh, you know, see what's going on you know how many people are going to actually end up you know making an appreciable effort towards you know uh like you know combating this type of thing and i think the answer is probably not a lot and i think that that's a, a more a more interesting question to look at yeah not for not for not for me it isn't and for me the most interesting question the the one that's most interesting for me is what am i going to do like, that's the one. What am I going to do? Question. What have I done? Because it's easy for me to look around at other people and be like, hey, man, I, I don't. Here, let me, you, you know, this, here, here's, a, here's a figure, right, that, that I, I have on a slide, but the poorest 10%. So the World Bank calculates that the poorest 10% of Americans, of people living in the United States, are better off than two-thirds of the world's population. That means it's like, man, we're here. You, the, the four of us, we're, we're really, really well off. And so like, I, I would just need to look in a mirror every day and be like, dude, what are, what are you, Sam, what are you doing? That's the most interesting question for me, right? Not to look at you guys, not to look at somebody else, not to count up everything, but it's really just looking in a mirror. That's for me, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, Quentin, final thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, 
for me personally, it's like I kind of realized that all, all, basically all the things that I own come from people who are like, you know, they're struggling. Um, Not all of them, stuff. by the way. Not all of them. Just some of them. But go ahead. Some of them. But I have this stuff. And it's kind of hard for me to, like, realize that, you know, like, kind of hard for me to just pick out things that are made by slaves. Because, um, like, my phone, for example. I would um, never guess. I, I can't. I, I kind of, I guess it's essential. Like, I need that. Um, but I kind of feel like that going forward and moving forward, it's, it's good for me to be aware of the things that are going on in the world. And like, and then when I get to a position, hopefully where I can help out and make a difference, then I, that's what I do, you know? Yeah, um, cool. But time will tell. All right, that's cool. Yep. Yeah, you don't have to wait too long, man. You can make a difference <laughs> anytime too. Hey, listen, Any you guys. Uh, hey, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for being vulnerable, all right? Like, thanks for that, I appreciate it. And thanks for coming in for sure. Um, enjoying the chocolate you can by the way you can finish it it's there <laughs> I can't do so. today, bro. Not right <laughs> normally yeah. i would say like hey I'd, I'd ask you to eat it right on the screen but i'm not gonna do <laughs> that, that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. all right so we have a question question from the stream go ahead man with the modern day slavery, uh, what is it that we in the United States or other countries can do? Like, how would you go about combating slavery in these countries? Well, so here's one thing, like for one, definitely don't, um, you don't boycott things, right? Like you don't boycott chocolate, right? Because that just hurts everybody. You know, buy fair trade goods, buy fair trade shirts, buy, you can, you can uh, you know, it's harder with electronics, I'm afraid, but you can, seek out and buy fair trade. And by the way, fair trade chocolate is always going to taste better than that crap. What they ate, the M&Ms and Hershey's and stuff, that's not even chocolate. That's just shit, right? When you eat real chocolate, you, you're you eating really good chocolate and you know it's really good chocolate. So that's tend to, that's going to tend to be sourced from in a way that's really good. Um, so, uh, and no, you, you don't, don't invade. You just, no, we work at it, right? Like we're the, 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 the campaigns to pressure Hershey and to pressure Nestle into really following the, the 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 sourcing of the chocolate. You know these precious metals, right? Coltan and tantalum and so on, right? Um, and cobalt. Like these are these are like we can we can find a way, and that's these you know, we, and we do. People are working at it. So some of you may be working at that in the future. So, yep. All right, man. Uh, hey, let's go with, um, let's bring, we have a couple more people, a couple more. We have three people, it looks like. Oh my gosh, three Thon people. Delaney and Grant and Olivia. So you can, you can, we can just bring them on, turn their cameras on really fast. And then we will, we're going to go in a slightly different direction here. So let's, let's just see where we are. Can someone just say what Thon is so people who don't know, and especially like our three former guests, they just got up here. So a lot of people don't know what Thon is. Who wants to do that? Olivia, is that you? What's Thon? Uh, so it's an organization basically that raises money for childhood cancer. Um, most Mostly throughout the year, um, we just raise money, but then it culminates in a 46 hour dance marathon um normally in february and um each organization has dancers that get to participate and it, it is in fact you left out one key piece by the way oh, it's the yeah. largest student, the largest student philanthropy <laughs> in the world by far and I'm, I'm old enough that. i've been around here long enough that i remember when thon happened in the white building and you know there was and uh, in the gym right there. And I remember going to the White Building on a Friday night or Saturday night and with me and two or 300 other people just kind of watching. So, and the dancers, in case you've not been to Thon, the dancers are, they're not so much dancing. Well, there are, there's a dance you know, like once an hour and so on that people learn. And then there's a lot of milling around. So, however, I call it sometimes the milling around slash dance marathon. However, what I will say is, I want to say this to the three of you before we go in the next direction. Um, Thon is awesome, man. Thon is, uh, it's not, it's not only is it awesome just because of 
what what you know it's doing and what you all are doing and other volunteers right and raising funds but it, it's also really awesome because it as a sociologist every stu- the the be- the best predictor of whether people will get involved in be in actions that help other people, volunteerism and so on, and give their time to other folks. The best predictor of that is former volunteerism. And so th- what that means is that when you volunteer for one thing, you're more likely to volunteer for another and another and another, right? So when you give of your time once, you give of your time again. And so what people really need, it's like priming the pump, right? So what Thon does is he gives thousands and thousands and thousands of students here at Penn State, many thousands, uh, opportunities to get involved in volunteering, which means that they're much more, when they leave Penn State, they're much more likely to be involved in other organizations, not just, you know, organizations for kids, but any number of things um, and helping out other people. So Thon, Thon is awesome in that sense. In fact, I will say that the fundraising that Thon does for cancer is actually pretty small in comparison to the future fundraising that the students each year who are involved will do throughout their lives in other organizations, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so Thon is, so Thon's very cool. Um, however, I, I'm gonna take you all, can you bring bring everybody back on screen really fast? And, uh, okay, so does that make sense? So Thon's, I'm a big Thon fan. Uh, and now I'm gonna take you on a, on a, Grant, you're, are you frozen? I think Grant is frozen. Hello? Yeah, there you are. You're back, dude. All right. All right. Hey, so listen, I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to talk about some things, and I'm going to come back, and we're going to have a conversation at the end, all right? So give me maybe like uh, 15 minutes. You can just watch Twitch and see where we're at, and then we'll go from there, okay? And then we'll have a, we'll, we will have a conversation similar to the one that we just had. Okay, so um, Nish and Jeff, uh, you can bring, let's go, let's come come back on. So uh, I wanna talk about cotton right now. And, um, and in particular, I wanna talk about forced labor and cotton. And, uh, it, it's a, in, and I'm gonna start in India. I, I can start uh, in, in, you know, in lots of places, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna start in India. And, um, so first off, when we think about slavery and the, more slaves in the world today than at any point in human history, and the slaves are doing many, many different things. Uh, and, um, but forced labor and agriculture, the agricultural sector, or the production sector and doing all, uh, and there are probably more slaves in India than anywhere else in the world and doing all sorts of things. You know, making clothes, making matches, um, harvesting, um, cotton is one, and probably about, um, and India produces about 20% of the world's cotton, and that's essentially important, and about 15 million slaves in India, which means there are a lot of, there are a lot of Indians working in the cotton industry, and those that are working in the cotton industry, a lot of Indians working as slaves, and, and many of those working as slaves in the cotton industry. In fact, more slaves working in the cotton industry in India than probably any other industry in the world. They're working about 10 to 16 hours a week and, and cotton accounts for about $9 billion in exports for India. Uh, pardon me, 10 to 16 hours a day, y'all, right? 10 to 16 hours a day, that is seven days a week. And this includes children. So that photo right there is a photo of people who are working in India as slaves picking cotton today, okay? So go to the, uh, and that cotton, by the way, is making, if you, most of you who are watching right now, if you, you, with the clothing you have on, is probably made of cotton, and your drawers and in your closets are filled with cotton clothing, and the cheaper that clothing is, the less expensive it is, the more likely it is to be made of inexpensive cotton that was produced at some level of the process by slaves. So um, let's go to the next slide. Not only is do we see slavery in cotton, but we see slavery, we see insecticide usage and pesticide usage. So cotton 
is about 2.4% of the global crop that is produced, of all the global cropland in the world. About 2.4% of the global crop produces cotton, but yet 24% of all the insecticides that are being used in, in the world today are used on cotton and 11% of all the pesticides being used in the world today are used on cotton in that industry, which is only 2.4%. So let me just show you something. So here's a woman. Um, so these guys here, go back, go back. So that photo right there is, these are guys in India who are spraying pesticides and insecticides. So this is what they look like. Just like, you know, they got the spray on their back holding on to it. They're walking through the fields. They are spraying. All right. Okay. Here's another next slide. Here's a young woman who's picking cotton. This is also in India and she's protecting herself from the pesticides and the insecticides by wearing that cloth, cloth around her face. Okay. Here's what it looks like in the United States. That's what somebody wears in the U S. So take a look at that. Look at that's that's the level of danger that's involved in spraying these pesticides and insecticides. Look at this guy right here. He's ready to do that work. So back to these Indian guys. Go back to that very first slide. I just want to so look at them. So think about that. Think about the American guy, right? It's mandated by OSHA regulations in the United States. Look at her. Look at this guy and look at this guy. These are, these are, look at the next one. These are really dangerous chemicals that are being used. Dangerous. I, look at this guy, man. You don't have to be like, you don't have to say much. So here's the result of that. So next slide. Yeah, Sam, before you say that, as a person who's worked in agriculture for 10 years, I can tell you that this is 100% true in the United States. Every summer, we'd have to get all of our employees to, together and Penn State would actually come to us to talk about pesticides and how to be safe and how far we had to be. And our boss is luckily enough to be able to do this at his own house. So he did it on weekends. So we were never near that. But it can cause cancer by you being anywhere close to it. It's not even like you have to be the one spraying. You could be a little bit away and still get affected. And this is the difference that we're working in in the world today. So it's like the it's like the pandemic that we're in right now with COVID. You think about that, just the, the, the I sneeze and how it goes across the room. Well, that's how these sprays are. These are really dangerous. So here we've got all these people working in the fields, making, you know, um, growing cotton, um, picking cotton, fertilizing cotton, et cetera. And also that we can have the clothing that we want to have, you know, all over the world in India, but here for sure, because how do you think, how can I buy this shirt is fair trade, but how do you think you buy like a three or $4 t-shirt? You buy it because it's been made by really, really cheap labor. So go to that, go to that next slide. Um, so here are some kids. Just a couple of photos of kids who are working in the fields and about 200,000 people a year die from insecticide and pesticide uh, poisoning and millions are poisoned, right? But about 200,000 people die according to the World Health Organization in the UN, right? So the, the girl in the upper left is in India, the girl on the lower right is in Uzbekistan. So hold that. So here, I want to show you two other photos, right? So these people are getting poisoned, poisoned by these pesticides and insecticides. This is a children's cancer hospital in India. So all these children have cancer. So many of them, you know, most of them were out working in the fields. Most of them are, you know, picking cotton. They're very involved and cotton is good for kids because you need really nimble. It's a, it's a job that they like children to do because you need really nimble fingers and you can work fast and you just keep working and working and working and working, right? We pay you nothing to very, very little. So some are slaves and others are working as essential slaves in deep, deep sweatshops. Here's another photo. So this is a child 
a Thon child, right, who has cancer. So I want to I want to go go back, go back one. So here are these kids, and then go forward. Here's this kid, this child, right? What's the difference between them? Like, what's the difference? The the value, the lives of these children are just as valuable in every way, shape, or form, certainly in the eyes of God, the creator, as the eyes of this child. And we don't bring our attention, we bring our attention on this child, and not everybody, and this is, of course, one of the awesome things about Don, is because it brings our attention to a child like this and to families that are going through cancer. And if you've been, if you're part, you know, my, my uh, cousin and my one of my dearest friends works in the, the University of Michigan Cancer Clinic. And man, the stories, I guess, those of you who've been through it, those of you who've had cancer, those of you who had cancer in your families, right? You know what it is. And it's heartbreaking for all of us. And it's also, it's some level heartbreaking that our attention gets paid in one direction and maybe not another one, right? So here, next slide. Um, aside from slavery, my friends, is sweatshop labor. So the ways in which there are sweatshops all over the world, all over the world, and in, in, in a sweatshop is defined as a place where people are operating, people are working, that has poor, the four things, poor working conditions, unfair wages, unfair meaning like sometimes really, really minimal, like these kids might make 20 cents for a 10 or 12 hour day. Unreasonable hours and lack of benefits. And these kids are working. They're making, they're making clothing that could be, I mean, who knows anything, right? That they could be making. Here's a, here's a young boy working in a sweatshop layer. Just millions and millions of children around the world working in sweatshops to make stuff for us, right? To make stuff that gets exported all around the world by companies to be consumed by us, y'all, right? It's like, so slavery is one piece. Sweatshop work is another piece. People just getting paid pittance and children being involved, okay? Here, let me show you a couple other slides. Here's a factory. This was, I, I think this comes from Bangladesh. Here's a sweatshop, just making, just imagine sitting at one of these sewing machines for 10, 12, 14 hours a day and walking home with a dollar fifty. Knowing that you're producing things that are being sent all over the world. Imagine that. And that's it. And that's it. And then when you rise up and when you decide, like, hey, I'm gonna stand up, we're gonna unionize, we're gonna organize, you know, the owners can just pull out. They can even leave all the machinery light there. They can just pull out and they'll just go somewhere else where they can exploit other labor in some way. And here's one final, hey, yeah, just like another, you know, it's estimated that about a, a million people in Uzbekistan are working, are working as slaves in the cotton harvest every year. This is a photo from Uzbekistan, the cotton fields, critical crop, man. So here's the question I have, right? For the Thon, for Thon people. Um, I understand why we, you know, are, we're dealing with childhood cancer here in the United States. And, you know, here at Hershey, right? Like, you know, you, you can't, you know, you can't try to really, you can't do everything. And I, I understand what that's about and I get it. And, uh, but when I look at these, can you see this photo? Could go with the next photo, Jeff. When I look at that, and I see all those different colored t-shirts right there. And I know that every one of those t-shirts probably costs like two or three dollars, like really cheap. And then, you know, you have them printed with Ogana, what is Ohana or something, right? You put it on, you, you want to buy the t-shirt least expensive as you possibly can, because that means it's more money to go to Thon. But when you buy the t-shirt least expensively as you possibly can, that means it's more likely to be made by slave labor and sweatshop labor. It's almost a guarantee that it's been made by sweatshop labor and slave labor. If you don't buy it, if you don't buy it sourced for sure, that it's sweatshop free, it's been made by sweatshop labor. So when I look at all these t-shirts and I think, my God, you know, this is just, there, this is uh, the, the Bryce Jordan Center that's just filled with slavery. 
That's just slave labor. When I see that photo, I see slave labor and I see sweatshop labor, right? And I think how fascinating it is that this amazing project called Thon, which is awesome, right? Just ironically is involved by no by no choice or nothing by anybody like you know not wanting to think about it but by no choice of anybody d d deliberate choice anyway but it ironically is involved in reproducing sweatshop labor and even slave labor around the world and and even can't childhood cancer right in other countries just not here and how ironic is that and so i'm just want to see what you all I, and I have more questions to ask, but if you could just come back on the screen and just, I, what do you think about, what do you think about some of that? Um, it's definitely ironic. I know that between my org and uh, my committee, I personally last year had four t-shirts that I was supposed to wear um, during, over the course of Thon Weekend. And I, know I personally, I'm going to turn it into a t-shirt blanket when I graduate, but I know so many of the t-shirts that students wore are at some point going to end up in the landfill, landfill. So beyond that, like that's a huge ecological waste, but um, the fact that we probably killed multiple children with cancer in the process of raising all that money for kids in the U S is definitely ironic and not good. So, but let me be really clear about that. You pr probably any one thon does not, is not responsible for killing a child in India or Uzbekistan or somewhere else, right? So that I'm I'm not implying that, but you we are contributing to it in some way, right? We're cont contributing to a system in which many many people die from poisoning, right? As a result, um, I mean millions of people are involved in this, right? So, yeah, it's a it, but it's, so it is ironic. Uh-huh. And, and then these t-shirts show up, right? They're in, how much did they cost? Do you know? Do you have a sense of that? They were, most of them were probably around $15. So not, not very expensive. So, but I, I can go like to Michael's, for example, and I can buy a t-shirt for four. I can buy a black t-shirt for, you know, $3, $4, right? So the, 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 that's what the t-shirt costs. And then, you know, you have them printed somewhere. And then the, 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 the printer here who designs the logo and prints them, they make a lot of money, but the t-shirt itself costs, you know, a couple dollars, right? So Olivia, how, or Olivia, how about you? What do you, what do you, how does it kind of just sit with you? Like, I, yeah, I was going to comment on the irony of, of that as well. Um, for my organization, uh, specifically, Ohana, like Ohana normally orders around, I would probably say 200 t-shirts specifically for Thon Weekend. And just knowing that number and knowing how many organizations participate in Thon, I, I can't imagine the amount of t-shirts and just the amount of labor that goes into all of that. Just cotton. And yeah, and how people don't think about it. Hey, Grant, so one thing I want to say to you is, um, so for years I've been talking about this, right? And for years I've been trying to, like wanting to get people to sit down with the, with the main committee members of THON and say like, you know what? If you all did THON and, and talked about childhood cancer, but talked about childhood cancer, not just in here in, in the U.S., but childhood cancer all over the world and talk about this issue of, sweatshop labor and one thing after another. Thon could have such an amazing, a powerful presence and make such a powerful statement in the world on this issue of sweatshop labor in particular, especially because we have professors here who study this. We have a center here that deals with sweatshop labor. I mean, you could go, Thon could go so far toward making a statement to say, we're not going to accept this. Like we're not, it's not like, you know, it's not like, um, precious, the, you know, the, the metals in the phone, you're not going to, you're not going to stop that. You're not going to rework electronics around the world. Right. But this is something else that you really could do, but 
thus far it hasn't happened. Anyway, Grant, what do you so what do you think about that? Like for years I've been pushing this and for years it's just like, okay, yeah, I got it. So when I think of things like this, things, uh, how do I put it? Kind of these, uh, I can't say the word, philanthropic efforts. Philanthropic. Uh, yeah, that's the word. I can't. So when I think of those efforts, uh, I think the main thing that we see is that a lot of these are domestic and I'm a big proponent of before, uh, you may have heard it before, but before you go out to criticize the world, you need to make sure that your house is in perfect order. Yeah. And so that is before I go out to criticize things that aren't, that don't really involve me as much, I need to make sure that both my ethical and my moral compasses are point, pointing north. So yeah. when I think of things like this, I believe Thon is very good at domestically solving things like this because we still have issues at hand and before I go out and criticize things like that, I need to look at myself. I mean, I still have an iPhone. I'm wearing Nike stuff right now. The, I, who am I to be the purveyor of ethicality and morality by well, owning these products? So it's very, it's a very, very fine line that we walk as Americans who yeah. are, are also privileged, but don't necessarily realize that in the grand scheme of things because it's uh -huh. kind of pushed away. Okay, so here's would be my response to that. I think that's an awesome. I think all three of you have given awesome responses. Um, I don't have a response. I, you know, I I'm, I I live my life trying to do the best I can possibly do. Try to be aware of things around the world, but and all the time recognizing my responsibility and my culpability toward things. Right. So um, there is this idea of like getting one's own house in order. But if in the process of getting one's house in order, we are really dis putting other people's houses in disarray, then it doesn't really help me to put my house in order, or at least I need to question, I need to stop and question that. Um, and, you know, some of it is just that it's more complex to understand, right? Like you could take a class in, in the labor and you would understand sweatshop labor really fast. It doesn't, it's not that complex. You don't need to major in it. You could just, you could just, study it for 10 hours and you'd get a lot of it. But yeah, I don't know. Can I make an additional comment? Yeah, go ahead, man. I think it's always interesting how many of the companies that have been sued for these, for these either, whether it be sexual harassment claims or even child sweatshop labor, uh, are the ones that are really making us feel like we're the bad people. So if, I, if we were to look at Nike, Nike yeah. hell has, uh, Nike's like, Nike is like the gold standard for this kind of stuff where numerous times they've had sexual assault allegations and they also run child sweatshops. And new, I think that was, oh God, it was like a research study in the nineties that kind of brought all of this to light We've about been, Nike. Nike's been under the, the eye of folks on this issue for yeah. two and a half decades. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, these are the people that are kind of, putting forth all the, a lot of social movements and kind of agreeing with them when really they aren't the most ethical of companies. Well, but this is the stuff. This is where it, this is why I, I teach a class like this, right? My, my, the, the reason I'm here is to raise more questions than I could possibly answer. Like I don't have answers for any of this stuff, right? It's just, it's, it's raise the questions, it's put it out there. It's like, you know, when I am, purchasing something like for example my wife and i we buy chocolate by the case so other people buy chocolate by the bar we buy it by boxes of 10 and we usually buy eight boxes at a time and it's actual real chocolate not that shit that these guys are eating in the other room this is the good stuff and it's fair trade and it's awesome and it's actually not very expensive and so you know like it's okay so i do that right when we source T-shirts, we source T-shirts like at World in Conversation. We make sure that we get fair trade T-shirts so that, we, you know, we make sure that they've been grown in good, the cotton's been grown in good conditions, that the workers have been paid a fair wage. And so it's it's little things like that, but there are other ways in which I fall short, you know, so, you know, we're all, we're all in that. Um, you, we can't, there isn't a sense at which we can, you can never, ever create the perfect path forward. You can't, it's like those of you, you know, if you're Muslim or Christian in particular, right? Muslims and Christians, where they have this sort of set ideology about sin, 
like good luck living up to the ideal that what it is, right? You can't live up to the ideal, but that doesn't mean you don't try, right? It doesn't mean that you walk around pointing fingers at everybody else, you know, because I point a finger at, at like at the three of you, let's say I have three coming back at me, right? So it doesn't mean we don't try to do that, but it means that, you know, we we do our best to really be, to understand things and we do our best, but sometimes we could do more and we don't do more. And like, you know, Kendrick, when he uh, was heard, first heard about slave chocolate, well, he probably wasn't watching a video like this one, but you know, he could have back then said, oh, he, 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 I gotta check this out, you know? So Delaney, how about, do you have any, any other thoughts, any other, like, I don't know, comments, thoughts? Um, I would actually love to share with the class. Uh, there's a website, I think it's called Good On You. Um, and basically you can look up different clothing brands and they have uh, a scale of how ethical they are, both ecologically and when it comes to labor. Um, and it's a really good way to measure the uh, most ethical consumption you can for your clothes. Hey, listen, thanks for saying that because there's so much out. The, the, the Google, as George Bush called it years ago, the Google is filled with information. You just got to use it. You know what I mean? Instead of like picking your phone up to look at another TikTok video, you just got to look at like fair trade, sourcing fair trade. You know what I mean? It's, it's amazing, actually, this tool. So, yeah, there's so much. Put, it, put that in the chat, by the way, just so that people... Olivia, how about you, man? Any any uh, other thought? I was just gonna say, I think it's really difficult to like figure out like when it's okay to kind of just like wear the shirts that are like that are made from these like horrible conditions, and then also. Um, like when to try, I, I don't really know what I'm trying to say. Just like, it's hard to figure out like when you're trying to do good and how to, I don't know if that makes Listen, sense. Listen, man. Okay. No, that's cool. I like, I like what you're saying. Cause you're sort of going in a circle and that's a good thing. You should be going in a circle because, um, the, the, the we only should be going in circles at this stage. The, these are, you know, moral and ethical concerns, right? These are, they, they're not, they can't solve them. They don't get solved quickly, right? We we land on somewhere. And, and so we should be, especially at, at your age. I'm confused and I, I'm 40 years older than, than the three of you, you know what I mean? So if you're not confused, you have no idea what's going on. Hey, do we have a, we have a question from the screen of the stream, I think, Sam, uh, you should present this at the next time. I know, I, I you know, I, so I used to be in a, I was in a band. We had a band in the sociology department and we played at Don a couple of times. And I was going to just stand up on stage instead of playing a song and just start talking about this. But I didn't feel like it was really right to do that. So anyway, uh, yeah, listen, man, I, I would love to see folks just move on this. It, it, it does, you don't take anything away from, from, Hershey and all the work that's being done. And I understand that, you know, you all are busy trying to just do that one single minded thing, which is raise money. And so next one, man, is there another comment? Uh, what t-shirts they're wearing is it depending on the cause uh, that they're serving? What What is the irony that, yeah, the t-shirts thing. Yeah, um, what is the irony? Wait, I think I don't understand that one, by, I by the way. I think the question or the statement is they're doing a really good thing in terms of thon um yeah. so t-shirts that they're purchasing are independent of the good thing that they're doing in thon well nothing's independent right it's like if i if in order for me to to um to feed my children i have to take food from somebody else who's feeding their children you know what i mean like nothing's independent it's all connected everything is connected so if I'm, you know, if I'm, if someone is spraying pesticides on cotton that's being picked by children and, 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 but, and I'm like buying that cotton so that I can help these other children over here, that makes no sense. It's all connected. Everything is connected. So 
Go ahead, man. Do you have another one? Uh, the same being one U.S. dollar restricted purchasing power in the United States. So when, no, no, no. One U.S. dollar. One U.S. dollar, period. So the idea that, like, people will say, like, well, okay, so Haiti, right, the, 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 the minimum uh, salary in Haiti, which is supposed to be guaranteed by the Haitian government, is $5 a day. $5 a day, right? That's five U.S. dollars a day. But listen, man, a small bag of a, a, of a, a, a cup of rice in Haiti is going to cost 50 cents. Like a, a small a cup of rice, a cup of white rice in Haiti is still 50 cents. It's not like I, but it's Haiti. Things are cheap. I can buy rice for nothing. Like, no, no, no. A cup of rice is still going to cost you 50 cents. So if I'm making $5 a day, one of those hours is going toward buying just the rice that I need for maybe for my whole family. So it's like that, that's one of those myths that people, there is the purchase, PPP, purchasing power parity, it's called. You do that, but sometimes you don't need to do that. Sometimes this is really what it is, people. Yeah, next one, man. Um, where do you order chocolate? Uh, we get our chocolate from, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll bring it in, man. I'll, I'll bring it in. I can't, um, it's just like, his, I was going to bring a bar in, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll. I'll bring a bar in next week. I was going to bring some. Yeah, I forget. Okay, anybody else? Um, all right, listen, final, final thought. Grant, did you have a final thought? Um, None for me this time around. All right, all right. Dude, I'm surprised. Any, Delaney, Olivia, anything? All right, man. Uh, Hey, okay, I have a final thought then, class. So here's what's up. Hey, by the way, can you come bring them back on the screen really fast? Hey, thank, thanks, first off, thanks for being involved in THON. It's awesome. Um, and thanks for coming on the stream. And yeah, thanks for sharing. It's cool. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. I'd have one more. One more thing. So, All right, go THON, ahead, man. THON is actually a... Uh, it's, it is an, it is a uh, event that only a very small minority of the uh, student body actually uh, takes part in. I think the number is like 30% of the student body takes part in THON. And that is, honestly, for as, they must have ridiculous PR teams because they can really advertise. And it really seems as if a lot of people do take part in it. But honestly, it's about 20 to 30% of the student body. And that's, yeah, it's like 10,000 people, man. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. 